Here's how to tie a figure eight follow through, which many people use to tie into the climbing rope. Start with three or four feet of rope, make a loop, wrap the rope around, poke it through. Now you have your eight. Now take the end of the rope and pass it through the two tie-in points on your harness, not the belay loop, that's for your belay device. Pass the end of the rope through the two hard points, also known as the tie-in points, because that's what they're for, and pull the knot right up next to your harness so the finished knot will be just an inch or two above the tie-in points. To retrace the eight, start on the outside of that first strand. Start hard to finish easy. There's a bigger hole on the right side, but we go through the left side there because the knot will end up dressed more neatly. Now follow the initial strand, follow the eight all the way through until you've retraced the whole thing and the end comes out the top of the knot. To check if you've tied it correctly, you can count two, four, six, eight, ten. You should have five pairs of doubled strands and a sufficient tail. This knot tied correctly with sufficient tail is a standalone knot. It does not require a backup, unlike a bowline, which you must back up. However, if you have a bunch of tail and you want to keep it out of your way, you can tie a double overhand to keep that tail out of the way. To tie an overhand knot on a bite, you take the end of the bite, pass it around the back of the rope, and pull it through the loop. Dress it neatly, and you are good to go. For a figure eight on a bite, you take the end of the bite, pass it around the back. Instead of going through the loop as you would for an overhand, you go around one more half turn and then through the front of the loop, and as always, dress your knot neatly. This is a little easier to untie after being weighted than the overhand is. You can tie what some people would call a figure nine, figure 10, figure 11, just a figure eight knot with additional wraps. So instead of making that figure eight, you just take the end of your bite more times, as many more times as you want around the base of the knot. These additional wraps eat up material. If you're trying to make your master point a little higher, that's nice. And the more wraps you add, generally the easier this knot is going to be to untie if you've dressed it neatly. So that could be called a figure nine, and then if you add an additional wrap, you could call that a figure 10, I suppose. I don't think these are official names for the knots, but the idea is it's a figure eight with additional wraps. Here's a more complicated knot, sometimes called the super eight, or informally, the bunny ears knot. So if I put the end of the bite through the loop here, that's a figure eight. But if I lay the middle of the bite across the loop, pull both strands through, and then wrap the end of the bite around the entire knot, I end up with these two loops, which I can adjust. The bunny ears, you could say. Notice that the strand that you use to adjust the bunny ears, the strand that connects the two of them, should sit at the top of the three strands at the bottom of the knot. And this is a really useful knot in anchor building. I can use this to link two pieces of protection and make little adjustments to the equalization really easily. And as always, dress your knot neatly. The BHK is a bite knot that you can tie in the middle of a piece of material. Normally you tie a bite knot at the end of a loop of cord or other material, but in this case you can just grab the middle, tie your big honking knot wherever you want it, and then you do have a little tail on the left side in this image, which if that tail pulled back through the knot, the whole thing could come undone. So what you do is take that little tail and pass it around the end of the knot. Now it can't come undone because it's trapped. And there's your BHK. This is a really useful knot for making master points when you build a big anchor out of static rope. To make a double overhand, pinch the rope with your thumb and wrap the end twice around your thumb in an upward direction, second loop above the first. Pass the end through both loops and dress the knot. After it's dressed, you should be able to see an X on one side and an equals sign on the other.
You can make a triple overhand, which is just three wraps instead of two. Make sure your wraps go in an upward direction, meaning away from the end of the rope, and then pass the end through all three wraps and dress it neatly. This is a beefier stopper knot or a backup knot that eats up more material. A double fisherman's knot is the knot most commonly used to link your cordelette into a loop. It starts with a double overhand tied with one strand around the other. Make sure you get that X and equals sign. Then you take the other strand and do the same thing. Tie a double overhand going in the opposite direction with that strand around the first. When you have your two double overhand knots, you dress them and then you pull in opposite directions on the loop of cordelette until the knots slide against each other and lock. It's very important to leave an adequate amount of tail on each end and dress and tighten this knot carefully. To tie a water knot, which is a great way to link two pieces of flat material like webbing, first make an overhand in one piece of material. Then starting from the end of that piece, Retrace that overhand with the other and make sure you leave an adequate amount of tail on each end. Dress the knot neatly, making sure both pieces are flat against each other throughout, and tighten it down. This is a knot that can get welded after being loaded, not a very easy knot to untie. A basket hitch is very simple. You take a loop, such as a shoulder sling, wrap it around something, such as this carabiner, or with a larger piece of material you could wrap around a tree, and grab both ends. There's your basket hitch. This is great for quickly extending an anchor or your belay device. To make a girth hitch, you take one end of your loop, put it around whatever you're hitching around, take the other end and pull it through the loop, and pull to tighten. This gives you a longer extension than a basket hitch, but you're only on one strand of material instead of two, and it makes a sharp bend around whatever you've tied it around, in this case the carabiner, which slightly reduces the strength of the material. To tie a clove hitch, start by making a loop right strand behind left. Then, right behind left, make a second loop in the same direction. Pass the second loop in front of the first, and clip a carabiner through both loops. This is a great way to attach your rope to an anchor point or to tether yourself to the master point of an anchor. You can really quickly adjust a clove hitch. You just pull on one side of the knot to pull some rope through and then pull the other strand to pull that rope through the knot. It's really important to tighten both strands and then make sure you can't pull rope through the knot. Many times I'll tie a clove hitch directly onto a carabiner rather than tying it in midair, especially when I'm tethering myself to an anchor. In which case I pass the rope through the carabiner, then I take the strand that's coming out the back of the carabiner, twist it across the gate, and pass this new loop through the gate. When you dress your clove hitch, make sure you can't pull rope through the knot. Sometimes you fail to put a half twist in the system and you end up with a munter hitch instead of a clove. The difference is when you pull on one strand of a munter, it flips and slides. When you pull on a clove hitch, it locks. To tie a munter hitch, put your rope through a carabiner, take the back strand, and bring it across the front strand and clip it through. Unlike with the clove hitch, you don't put a twist in it while bringing the back strand across the front. You should end up with a knot that slides through the carabiner, and depending on which strand you load, it may flip, as it has, of course, the two different orientations for feeding out rope versus pulling it in. An auto block is the simplest friction hitch. Take your loop of cord and wrap it around the rope. The number of wraps will depend on the relative diameter of the cord and the rope and how new and slippery they are. When you have what you believe to be the right number of wraps, clip through both ends of the cord. And then to make sure you've tied an adequate friction hitch, you must always test your friction hitch. You should certainly test it in the expected direction of pull, and you may as well test it in the other direction too. This will help it dress a little nicer.
A Prusik hitch could be considered the classic friction hitch. In fact, these little loops of cord that we use for friction hitches are commonly referred to as Prusiks. To make a Prusik, you keep one side of your loop out and pass the other side of the loop around the rope going through the outer loop each time, spiraling from the outside towards the middle instead of spiraling from one direction to the other as you would with an auto block. A Prusik bites more readily than other friction hitches. It may take fewer wraps to make a good Prusik than it would to make a good auto block or Klim heist. The flip side of this is that a Prusik will bind more quickly. So if you're trying to tie a friction hitch that will slide easily along a rope, the Prusik might be really frustrating. However, if you're trying to tie a friction hitch with slippery or thin material and you're just really struggling to make one that bites, the Prusik is gonna be the one you want. And of course, always test a friction hitch. To tie a Klem heist hitch, wrap your cord in a spiral upward. The number of wraps will depend on the relative diameter of the cord and the rope and how new and slippery they are. Pass the bottom end through the top loop and pull down. A Klem heist is a one direction hitch. It's only good for that downward pull, so make sure you tie it the correct way. Always test a friction hitch. A Klem heist binds a little more readily than an auto block. So if you're having trouble getting a hitch to bite, the Klem heist will work better than an auto block, but it doesn't bind quite as readily as a Prusik. It's a little easier to work with. A shoulder sling and two carabiners is commonly referred to as an Alpine quick draw or an Alpine draw. To stow this compactly, you take one carabiner, pass it through the other, and clip to any two strands. This is now approximately the length of a standard quick draw, and you can clip to a piece just like that. If you want to extend a placement, you remove one carabiner and clip it to any one strand, and you should be able to pull it into its full length. Clipping carabiners opposite and opposed means clipping the carabiners in the opposite direction and also making sure the gates are opposed. This would usually apply to building a top rope anchor where you're using two non-lockers for your master point. If the gates faced the same direction, they could press against something and both open, reducing the strength of both carabiners. So the gates need to be opposed. You also clip them in opposite directions so that if one rotates, you don't end up with that same problem. Adding a third carabiner gives you extra width there and helps the rope run smoothly and of course makes your anchor even more redundant. Note that for other applications, such as tethering, you would normally use a single locker, but you can substitute two opposite and opposed non-lockers. However, at the master point of a top rope anchor, where you would normally use two or three non-lockers, you cannot substitute a single locking carabiner. To be properly redundant, you need at least two carabiners there.